Hello YouTube family, Carl Baldessar back again with another great song by Led Zeppelin. This one is off of the album Presence and it's called Nobody's Fault But Mine. It's a classic blues song that Led Zeppelin and Jimmy Page really turned into a killer rock song with a lot of idiosyncrasies in it. And why I'm showcasing this song and breaking it down for you is that it's absolutely one of the more schizophrenic sort of things to learn because when you listen to all the different versions, the way they played this live over the years, it's never the same in terms of the little subtleties of how they played these parts, especially Jimmy Page. Man, he had all sorts of alternate picking techniques and different ways that he, he would express the different parts. And at the end of the day, you just got to say that, you know, they were just living in the moment and they were just playing this song just however it came upon them on any given evening. So what I want to do is show you some of my favorite little variations on the themes as I go through this. Let's check it out. So let's jump right into the introductory phaser flanger guitar part and let's talk about the variations on that theme the way he's playing it live. And there's four parts of that introduction and the first part is this. Part two is this. Part three is. Part four. So the little variations that you'll hear, which will drive you nuts if you're trying to nail one version down because you won't find it, he'll sometimes he'll do a picked uh, version of that where it's right, and other times he'll do pull-off versions like that, and then he'll also slide up as opposed to bend up. So here's the slide up version. Okay, and here's the bend up version of that. And then the other variation on part three that you'll hear only on the live versions is where he's using the major third, a G sharp, as opposed to a natural G. So you get. So that's the natural version you hear in the studio. Sometimes you get the G sharp live, okay? And I'll take a moment right here because everybody always asks me about Page's tendency to mix major and minor sounding tonalities. And he does that all the time. And it works a lot because often he's working in a pentatonic universe and a pentatonic collection of five notes, okay, has no leading tone, no seventh of a scale degree in there. So it really opens up the possibilities to mix kind of the major and minor feel. He does it all the time. He even does it on this song. So in the studio version, you have the down to the G, right? And then on the fourth part, he adds the major third. Okay, so let's put it all together. We're gonna do the studio version of it and it goes like this. Notice on that last chord, he's upstroking that, right? And so you got the. Very cool sound, isn't it? Great introduction. All right, let's move on to the actual introduction before the verse. And um, he's got so many different ways that he plays this, but I'm going to actually do the version from the Neverworth concert. And I love the way he's using the perfect fourths here. So it goes like this. And what's really cool about that, you'll notice that he's using perfect fourths and he does a, a slide down on the first one. And then he does, immediately he moves down to the B here and he starts doing a pull off. So it's a slide. And then the open E. And then he ends with the power chord A. But I just love that and it's really blinding fast. I'm actually not playing it quite as fast as he plays it, but he's got this. Yeah, there you go. That's the intro. All right, now let's have a look at how he plays the verse parts of the song. And again, it's all over the place. So many different ways he's doing it. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of, um, of versions of the way he's doing it. So generally the riff opens with these triplets, these digging a digging a, right? So you have this. <laughs> OK, 
okay? So that's generally the collection of the four riffs for a verse, right? So he's got the triplet feel, which is the, uh, you know, digging a digging a dig dum, right? So, okay? Uh, and then he, on the second phrase of each verse, he's then sliding up to a major, uh, with a major third in the E, okay? So we're now just in these power chords. And I should mention that the whole zeitgeist of this riff is, is all about these power chords with pull-offs to the open A string. So, so that is really the whole feel of the song. It's these little triplet-y kind of pull-off open power chord vibe. Digging a digging a dig a, you know? <laughs> Right? So then the second uh, phrase that he's doing on that verse riff is when he goes up to the major third here on the E chord. So it's... So we get the... So we get the G sharp up here, right? And he plays that so many different ways. You get, you get this one in the studio, you get... You get that where it's... Sometimes you get this... You know, you get that one live, you know? But I do like doing this one. You know, that's the one the most common. I really like that one. And then the third phrase of that, it's back to um, the, uh, the triplety field. The, and he adds that little bounce you know, on the E chord. So. And then the last one is the full triplet feel where you get it. And you do the hard stop on the E. So all together you got this. All right, there you go. So let's talk about the turnaround figure that he's using. And the phrase that comes before it is sort of the, the chorus of the song where Robert Plant sings Nobody's Fault But Mine. And that has this climbing chord figure, which is... <laughs> You know, which is just merely kind of, I'm using um, kind of perfect fourth power chords up here. So I'm using kind of E to F sharp to G to A. That's all. So. Okay, so you have that. And then they go to the turnaround, which is this figure here. Right? And sometimes he'll vary that a little bit. He'll do, a, instead of doing just... Sometimes we'll actually bounce it. Doesn't matter. I guess I'll stop here and just say what's so great about Led Zeppelin and all of the four musicians in the band is that they live in the moment. I mean, that's the secret to Led Zeppelin. That's certainly the secret to Jimmy Page. And that's why when you listen to this song and all the live versions, there's so many variations on the themes and the figures. And all you can conclude is that there's no right or wrong way. It's just living in the moment. And because of all this variety, you know they're just vibing at that moment and expressing themselves as artists. And you get all these cool little artifacts. So there's no right or wrong way. All of it's fair game. Just go for it, you know? But the turnaround thing I wanted to point out is that on the live version, instead of doing the A chord, he actually gives you a mystery chord. And I'm going to reveal it right now, okay? He does this figure for the turnaround. And you got to do the karate chop to make that work, you know? <laughs> because you got to keep time with this. And Jimmy Page is like the conductor on stage. This song is really all about the math, and you have to be able to count to four to really get this song right. But back to the mystery chord. So he's doing this. And what that is, is a quintal sound. Quintal meaning five. So we have two perfect fifths that are stacked on top of each other. We have a G to a D, and then we have a D to an A. And when you put that together, get this stacked, beautiful, gorgeous, lush sound, a quintal sound, which is very, very cool. Classical, actually, kind of 20th century classical. You see Bartok using it, Aaron Copeland using it, and it's super rip ripping on a rock, rock guitar. But he's actually playing it on the, using an open string, which gives it even more throat and girth. So he's got the G, then he's got an open D, and then he's got the fretted A, and you get this. And sometimes he's using the, the bridge pickup. 
I don't know if there's a better sound on the guitar. That's the coolest sounding chord in the world to me, you know? And then sometimes he'll give you a little bit of an overbrush and he'll pick up the B string on top and give you that little, you know, major second vibe there. But it's actually probably just an artifact of kind of he's a painter, Jimmy is, you know, with his picking and you get these little brush strokes. Sometimes they're a little wider, sometimes they're a little shorter. Doesn't matter. It's all just part of living in the moment. And uh, so there you go. There's your mystery chord from Nobody's Fault But Mine live. Let's move on down the road now. Hey, real quick, everyone. I want to also mention that I'm a composer, and you can check out all my music on carlbaldessarmusic.com. And especially for you Zeppelin fans, I have a couple Zepp-inspired tunes on my album, Grand Boulevard. Check out Sansa Tarifa and The Reckoning at carlbaldessarmusic.com. All right, so let's break this solo down, right? Right from the intro, you get some great classic pagey bends. You get this figure. So let's just take a quick look at that. Of course, the opening phrase with the beautiful bends, but I really love this little kind of bitonal phrase that's going on here where he does this G arpeggio. And he adds the six, the E. Because that's happening over the rhythm part, which is really this D pull-off power chord. Up to the E. So he's placing this G triad. G6 over this D, and when you put those two together, bitonally, harmonically, what's going on there, you get this pitch collection. Five notes, it's a pentatonic collection, it's the E minor pentatonic collection, and he creates that by having these two chords going on at the same time. The other classic thing that's going on there is that Jimmy Page is doing his sort of shape shifting where he goes from majors to minors. So we have this minor pentatonic, but the, the rhythm, or rather the solo, is largely in E major pentatonic. But for this one moment, we're getting an E minor pentatonic collection by virtue of, of that laying over the, the top of the G power chord. The other thing I like about in that part of the phrase is just the bending that we're hearing, you know, and if you look at Jimmy Page's career from early stage, middle stage, and late stage, as he got into late stage, especially here on Presence, you started hearing more of the weeping kind of bends that you get, which is the... You know, those really kind of heart-pulling sort of bends, and you'll see them later on during the solo as we go on. Let's take a look at the next section. So the next phrase has this kind of little finger twisty thing that he has to do, this little pentatonic move. You know, and that's kind of tricky because you have to cross your fingers over a little bit. But it's got another kind of weepy bend. Which is pretty nice. And then we go into these bends here. I love these bends, especially these where he's pushing from the B up to C sharp. So notice on that, you know, the way he's phrasing this section, he's got the C sharp bends. He's doing them twice because he's really making a point. What comes after that's really important. So you've got that. Hear that chromatic walk down after that? It's set up by kind of pausing on those C sharps. And again, we have another kind of later stage page weepy sound here. Yeah, that kind of move is a classic later stage page move. So again, we have the. Then he repeats the C sharp bend and holds it even longer. So then you have this cool kind of whole phrase, this question and answer, which is... <laughs> Sounds so complete, isn't it? The way he phrases that up. So then the next section, again, this whole solo is just dripping with emotion. And it's just so beautifully composed. So we have these kind of, you know, the last sort of descending... <laughs> now listen how just this weepy and bendy this is. 
I mean, it's just, there's so much emotion in that. It's just almost crying, you know? And then he beautifully slides up to that, uh, that D getting bent up to E, so. Awesome little phrase right there. Let's move on. Again, you, continu you continue with this sort of, just th th these kind of painful emotional bends, you know, on this next section, the uh, Right? And then he continues. Just, again, just so filled with emotion right there. And so for this next kind of phrase, he's actually returning back to the harmonic content of the section, and that is he's outlining an E dominant seventh chord. And I have to remind you that when Jimmy Page is soloing, he's not just throwing licks out in free time and free space. He is always connected to the rhythm, and he's always connected to the harmony. And here he's outlining an E dominant seventh. And you can see that he's just playing an arpeggio right there, but it's really important. He's not, not just throwing a bunch of licks against the wall. He's really thinking about how to pull it all together. So now the next section of the solo is Jimmy Page 101. You have to learn this triplet descending kind of pull off riff. He did it right from the very beginning from Led Zeppelin 1 on, and every guitar player should have this under their fingers. So he's got this figure going on. So he's got that beautiful, bouncy, kind of descending triplet pull-off figure, and you just have to add this to your repertoire. So grab it and actually learn to play it all the way down the figure. And do it in all the different positions on the neck. And if you can do it going up, that'd be great. So try to learn that triplet figure going down and going up. So the way he then closes out that triplet figure on the descent, he rises back up. This is what I'm talking about, how beautifully composed the solo is. There's ups, there's downs, there's questions, there's answers, there's re-registration, you know, starting down here. And then you're up here. And when he comes out of that riff, he goes back up. You know, ends back to the dominant seventh again, too. So perfectly composed. And then. And then he wraps up the solo with that E dominant seventh chord. He does that live, actually. So how he ends the solo with this E dominant seventh chord, right? And he's actually not hitting the the fretted B because he's got an open B, so, right? But the point I want to make here is that you should recognize this dominant seventh inversion. And an inversion is just taking a chord and rotating around by taking the, the note that's on the bottom, putting it on top, and then keep doing that until it returns back to its original voicing, but up an octave, okay? So we have the first inversion E dominant seventh chord here because it's got a G sharp in the bass note and it's on the fifth string. Now we're going to go into guitar teaching land for one second. So we're exiting nobody's fault but mine. And let me tell you a very important thing you need to do on guitar to really gain mastery of the neck. And that is to learn how to do chord inversions of the same chord up and down the neck. And what I want you to do is to learn how to do that on every string. So in this case, we're on the fifth string for our, where our bass notes are. And I've got the first inversion, E dominant seventh. Okay? But I want you to walk down and try to invert it down. So we're going to take it down a third, and now the bass note is the E, which is the root of the chord. So we have the first inversion of the chord. I mean, we have just the root position of the chord. Now we're going to take it again down a chord tone to the D, which is the seventh, and play an E dominant seventh with the bass note on the fifth string, and it's a D. And then we're going to take it down as far as we can go to the next chord tone, which is a B. And then we're going to play an E dominant seventh like that. My point is that you want to learn how to invert the chords up and down the neck. And know them up and down. And you want to do that on other strings too. So say, for example, if you want to do it on the fourth string, the D, I want to play an E dominant seventh. The first one that comes up on the neck is one in root position where the E is on the D string. 
Now I want to move up with this one. So we're going to go to G sharp for the bass note on the fourth string. E dominant seventh. Then we're going to go to the fifth of the chord, which is a B. And here's an, an E dominant seven. And then we're going to get the seventh note of the chord, the seventh in the chord, and we're going to play another E dominant seventh. So you want to be able to play all these inversions. flawlessly up and down the neck. Know all your chord inversions and you'll open up the real estate, real estate of the guitar neck and it will be miraculous for you. So we'll now re-enter back to nobody's fault but mine. Now let's move to the very end of the song and they take a variation of the riff. They only play it one time in the song and it's the ending phrase of the song and it's full-on triplety kind of feel. It's very fast perfect fourth, ripping down. He does it a number of different ways, as I've said before, but I like this version of it, and it's really, really clear. It's actually a little murky on the studio recording. It's kind of hard to tell what they're all doing, but this is the gist of what's going on there, okay? So you have the ending, um, where you have the, um, um, the kind of chorus ending phrase, which is the... <laughs> And then you got Robert saying, na 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 nobody's fault. And then they give you the triplety kind of verse riff. And they hold it right there. And then you get this cascading triplety feel all the way down. So let me show you how that goes. So it's. <laughs> Did you get that? It's so cool, isn't it? I'll slow it down for you. It's all triplets. So it's. um. Let's see, we'll do it this way. So, so it's dig on a dig on a dig on a dig on a dig on a. Right? So it's really fast actually. <laughs> there you go. And the whole band is doing it as a 2D section. A 2D is Italian, T U T T I, for all. All of them are playing this figure and this riff together. And I just have to tell you as a composer, sometimes when you actually have everybody playing the same figure in unison, although you might lose what they consider to be harmony, you get this really unique texture when you play a 2D type figure like that. And way to end this song where they're all coming together on that cascading triplety feel. I should mention that on that descending triplet figure at the closing, I'm using alternate picking. I believe that is what he's doing. It's a little bit like trying to do this kind of thing. <laughs> You're trying to rub your stomach and pat your head. So using alternate picking on the triplet feel, you get this. So all up and down, all the way down, you just have to get your shifts on all those triplet feels. So there you have it, a quick breakdown on the song Nobody's Fault But Mine and all the little nuances within it. It was a hell of a lot of fun for me to kind of break this down for you. I hope you'd enjoyed it. Please like, and don't forget to subscribe. I appreciate all the comments, but it really helps when you subscribe as well. And um, you know, hit the notification bell so you can keep track of all the new content that I'm putting out there. Thank you again for watching. I'm Carl Baldessar.